Well, ever since I can remember, I was a shy kid that felt more comfortable with animals. And I think if you start out that way, then you know them more than you do humans, you know? So I just, I don't know if I just that way, born that way, or I just learned it because those were my, my go-to for non-human. <laughs> Like my dad, when I was doing this, he's like, unless you're making a product that makes money, what's the point? You, know, you shouldn't, you gotta be making money for a reason. You know, making, you know, getting paid to save animals. What's that all about, you know? <laughs> what if our world could talk what would it say? Would you know how to hear it? These are the lives of those who listen for love, for life, for future generations. These are their stories, the stories of our world, the stories in our element. What did your mom say again about being unique? Oh, I always thought I was weird growing up forever. I was just a weird kid on the block. And she just said, you're not weird, you're unique. <laughs> and she actually gave me a shirt. I just remembered this one time for Christmas with little frogs on it. And she says, it ain't easy being green. So she knew. I don't know if I ever gave her credit how much she knew who I was. I've never really been a human relationship person. It just never made sense to me. <laughs> and so my brother was like the human I could really relate to and get my support from. And just being kind of an oddball in the world, he was always there to, to help me and buffer me and support me. And as a little kid, I remember in grade school, I was a crossing guard and kids would bully me, take my sign away from me. And one day he came and hid behind something. And when they did that, boy, he came out and really laid into them, not physically, but, and they never bothered me again. But I mean, that's just the way he was. Where I was a shy kid that felt more comfortable with animals. Everything was about the animal. I had a hamster or something that I, my dad had an abscess and just, you know, it's just a hamster. And I ended up taking him, walking two miles to the vet. I mean, that's how important that was to me at, at like eight. So, you know, of course, there's all those stories other people do this, but saving worms that come out of the ground since I can remember. So it was something, you know, how I think some people are just, maybe everybody has some kind of a calling. I mean, I just knew that's the only thing I could do. After high school, I couldn't get a, the job that I wanted. I wanted to work in our local zoo, but they weren't hiring women. But I knew I didn't want to be a vet. I didn't want to go to school and learn to operators. I didn't want to be a vet tech. The medical things were just made me queasy. So I knew I didn't want to do that. And I didn't really like school, so I didn't think, I couldn't think of anything I wanted to go to school to be. So. And I knew I wanted, so if it's not a vet, it has to be the zoo. That's the only place that had animals, you know, growing up in my hometown. And I felt like they probably need help the most. And in those days, in the 70s was back when zoos were really way, way worse than they are. And some, there's some good ones now and there's some bad ones still, but it's just, they were transitioning from bar cages to more naturalistic places. But any animal in captivity, even our pets, you know, they need, special care because they're not being who they were you know created to be so but it's especially hard for even sanctuary animals and, you know. 
The zoo, two years later, did hire women. I was the second woman to be hired there, but I was still living at home with my dog and my parents, and that my parents had to actually move away from me. <laughs> so they, they moved to a farm. I said, oh, now I gotta get my own place. But after that, once I moved away from home, and then when I moved away from Ohio, it was no stopping me then. You know, I just, I needed that, because I was so shy and introverted, I think those people sometimes need a push to be able to go beyond, you know, like I'd still be in my room with my dog. <laughs> if yeah, you I, a little kick out I did. <laughs> yeah, some people want to fly right away and some just don't, you know, and I was one that didn't. <laughs> I was too scared. <laughs> But don't be gobbling out in the country with them because people... Okay, what are we doing here, Ryan? Huh? What are we doing here? We're getting a nose full. <laughs> a nice warm water. We're sharing, aren't we? Yeah, that's very nice. a director that these are wild animals keep them wild animals don't interact with them they're just you know let them be who they are but when they're in captivity you can't do that because they don't get to go out and have family groups they don't get to go out and get their own food they don't have to find their own shelter all those basic needs of who they really are they've been taken away from them so that's when I started trying to figure out ways to enrich their lives and like I said, I was just a real outcast at that too. I was always in trouble because I was doing things like giving them toys and rawhide chew things for cats. And then, are you crazy? These are not little people, you know? So, but then later zoos did progress to where that's a main thing they get is enrichment. Yeah, that's the thing with working with animals is patience. Patience and love are the probably two most important things. Animals in captivity, because you just have to do everything on their terms. Can't force anything, and you just kind of stay with their behavior, how they're reacting to different stimulus, and then gradually, you know, work with, you know, start to touch them. Like I had a, a, a black, Jaguar, I remember this at the Cincinnati Zoo, and when he came in, he was maybe two months, two or three months old, and he'd been raised in somebody's home. So coming into the zoo, he smelled all these different smells and was, again, petrified. He, he would eat, but he would only eat at night. And, and he wouldn't even come out of the crate he was shipped in, so we put the shipping crate in the, in the cage area. And... Um, and we had an animal trainer that was one of those, you have to beat animals to make them do things. And he came and he said, I'll get Donald out of his cage. And he opened the door and he put one foot in and Donald reached out and swiped at him. And they're the most powerful cat of the cat family, you know. And he jumped back and he closed the door. He said, well, I'll come back later, but he never came back. So what I had to do is very slowly, I had this leather jacket that I put on my arm and reached in and just stroked him. And if he tried to bite, he wouldn't hurt me or, or scratch, he couldn't scratch me. And that took probably two months before he trusted me. But eventually when he came out and, and I would sit with him, then it was, he was sort of like a, a dog, really, more than a cat in, in the way we played with each other. But of all, the cats have different species personalities, like the, Lion just loves everybody, but the leopards are only like one person cats, and he was a leopard, so it was amazing when I would go play with him and he'd be like my little dog, and, and another keeper would come over and, <laughs> and they'd go, wow, that's amazing that you trust him like that. But again, that was just a part of patience and, and going with him when he accepted me, not making him accept me. So.
Yeah, I raised seven baby gorillas at the zoo. And then I was sort of the mom to Michael too. For the first two years he was in captivity. Well, it's very similar to a human mom with gorillas because they are a lot like humans, you know. And the little ones were on baby formula and, and diapers and in the beginning till they just would rip them off. But one thing I learned at the zoo is discipline. Just like humans, kids need boundaries. And I, I didn't want to discipline the gorillas and pretty soon they're just running all over and tripping me and I couldn't control them. And I said, I'm going to have to do something. And, and I just got a little more tough, like stop it or take them by the fur and shake them and put them in time out. <laughs> so they got their discipline too. <laughs> I think it was about two years that I hadn't seen Gigi and Sam. And they were even in a different zoo. They weren't even in Cincinnati anymore. And, and they were behind glass, so they couldn't even hear me. So when they saw my face, they recognized me. And Gigi signed food, eat, and hug. That's, I taught them maybe five signs at the Cincinnati Zoo, and those were two of them. So you knew she remembered me, and Sam was about eight years old so he was approaching adulthood and he just started ramming the glass like because that's what male gorillas do you know they have to be tough and then he stopped and his stomach was quivering you know i couldn't hear him but i knew he was crying because they go hoo, 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 hoo. and and it was like oh, i can't be crying <laughs> i'm an adult gorilla and then he started ramming again but then later when i got to see him where there was just bars and no glass that's when he came right up to me and put his hand behind my head and looked in my eyes and just started crying and crying because I was his mom and he hadn't seen me in two years. And I'm crying and I was embarrassed because I was with these keepers I'd never met and I turned around and they were crying. So it was very emotional and it really showed their emotions. You know, that they, they love and grieve. So one of the important people that I met when I worked there is Diane Fossey, and we corresponded for about six years. I would tell her some captive gorilla stories, and she'd tell me stories about hers in the wild. I got to know Digit, her favorite gorilla, through her letters. But I asked her once, what can I do more for gorillas than what I'm doing here? And she's the one that put me, she said, you should get in touch with Penny Patterson, who's working on her PhD in psychology with a gorilla teaching it sign language. So when I, so I wrote to Penny, and when they got a gorilla companion for Coco named Michael, then they needed a companion, uh, needed a mom and teacher for Michael. So I was hired to be his first mom and teacher. It, it, was, it was interesting in some of the little things that they could tell you, but it, it wasn't a deep conversation, you know? It was like, I want a drink, or let's go play, or let's go here. Um, but as I was working with both of the, both project, but mostly with the gorillas because it was the first time I had done that, is I would have much rather put that energy into communicating on their language instead of making them do our language. Um, and I don't know, that, that was just interesting that we just always have to be in about us. <laughs> That's what happened to Coco was she was more human than gorilla and kind of lost her gorilla-ness. I mean, it was amazing to see how human a gorilla could be, you know, with her communications. And yeah, she was amazing. But she sacrificed being a gorilla for that, you know. How does all that make you feel? Sad. It made me very sad to, when I saw her the last time. And I, I looked into her eyes and I felt she knew on some level, on that like soul level, that she wasn't given the chance to be who she was born as. That's what I felt when I looked into her eyes. She had a great life as far as all her needs met and a lot of love, 
So that's why I felt that I'm glad there's only one Coco that that happened to. But she did do some amazing, amazing things. And I, and I, I know she also raised awareness for other people about gorillas and probably helped projects to save gorillas. So she did a lot of good for gorillas. But for someone who raised gorillas and loves gorillas for being gorillas, it was just sad to not see her be a gorilla. But, and when I worked with Michael, I tried to, you know, let him be who he was as much as I could. And with Chantek the Orang, since Penny, the woman that did the Gorilla Project, was working on her PhD originally, so it was all about psychology. And the Chantek Project, she was an anthropologist, so that wasn't a need for us to see how human he could be. It was just see how, how he processed language, maybe how humans process language from the very beginning. Experiments aimed at increasing communication between animals and human beings are going on here in Chattanooga at the University of Tennessee. Just five years old and weighing 65 pounds, Chantek the orangutan is more active and mischievous than an entire class of kindergartners. Chantek is part of an experimental project being conducted by the anthropology department at UTC. He is learning sign language. He's learned about a hundred signs and uh, uh, what we're trying to learn is how he processes and how he thinks and so we're studying the context in which he signs these signs. That was pretty amazing you know you take one sign and you had to record when he signed it and what for then you could go back and see that one sign and go oh he called that 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 this name which you could see how his mind was working then that was pretty amazing I thought. He could see, my, one of my favorite stories is he was in his yard playing and he kept signing orange. And I'm looking for an orange somewhere or something that was orange because it was the same as the color. And I couldn't find anything. And then later on, way across the parking lot was a truck full of pumpkins. And to him, those were oranges. And so he knew what he was seeing. And they're, that's where I think they were different than the gorillas in, in that part of their curiosity to figure things out was a little stronger than the gorillas. I don't think the gorillas really were, like Chantek would do those puzzles without rewarding them, and you know, he just liked to do them. So it was just, who would have thought? And I just happened to think of it one day to try them on puzzles, and there he loved it. <laughs> I had to mix two puzzles, the pieces, so they'd have to find this piece for this and this piece for that. And, and if I tried to help him, he would bite me because he wanted to do it. It wasn't, it wasn't doing it because I was giving him a piece of candy for doing it. He wanted to figure it out. And that's what was amazing to me, to see those brain cells working. <laughs> yeah. And he enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, he did. One time he, he told me I was cleaning up in the kitchen and, or in the back room and he was in the kitchen, he came back and he started signing bad. And I, I just thought, oh, he's telling me he did something wrong, he's signing bad. And I went into the kitchen and I didn't see anything so I finished cleaning and then I went in to fix his lunch and I opened the refrigerator and he'd spilt milk in there. So he came back to tell me he was bad. I think those are pretty amazing. <laughs> I mean, he's understand the concept that he did something wrong. But I always also wonder if we didn't develop language, which we had to do, if we wouldn't communicate with each other a little bit better through the heart <laughs> instead of the mind. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's like those cultures that have 20 words for a snowflake or something, you know, something like that. It's so much more in depth than what our language really does, I guess. I think the m most amazing thing, I guess, that I've been lucky to find firsthand is that they all think and feel. And the gorillas, of course, the primates that I worked with um, are closer to us. So 
that was amazing to see the things that they were thinking, you know, and expressing and, and fear and humor <laughs> and love. And it's just to, to, to get that firsthand and see that all these animals, and that's, that's the other thing with my slideshow, everybody's amazed at the gorillas that sign and the orangutan that sign. But all the other animals are just as special. We just sort of relate better to them because they're closer to us. And you, th you think your dog, you know, knows everything you know and he feels pain and it loves you and has emotions. All animals do. I mean, cows and sheep and pigs. Pigs are smarter than dogs. And that's the point. I don't know how humans even started this with factory farming to abuse such a sentient being. And I, I don't really say everybody should stop eating animals because it's the amount we eat in our society. That if we, if we just cut back eating once a day even, I think factory farms would become extinct. And it's not because we need to. It's not, we, we can't survive with a one, one hamburger a day. We have to have one three times a day or we do it for fun. We abuse these in horrible ways. It's like the Holocaust for animals, for fun. So it tastes good and that, it just doesn't compute in my brain. And I think a lot of people don't know that either what happens. So it may compute once they know and so, some it changes, some they don't care. I think it was Albert Schwarzer said something like until we treat all animals with compassion that humans will not find peace and I think that's the missing piece in us finding peace that we're all a part of this and we need to treat everybody with compassion every being Yeah, we had little baby ducks in the sink there. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one one duck that had bad feet and we had to put popsicle sticks on his feet to straighten him out and he would tap dance around here. <laughs> but, but it pretty much looks the same. It's it's more crowded with more good stuff, you know. <laughs> um, Any impactful memories of, of interactions with animals you had there? Any of those stories? Um, wow. Well, there's so many. Looking back on the work that I've done, it's Wildlife Images was the most intense, uh, heart soul job I ever had, you know, of all the, I mean, I think partly because it was native wildlife, there was something special about being connected to your world as opposed to an elephant or a gorilla. Um, but then there was also that aspect that I never wanted to do, which was the medical. I was responsible. Um, I learned from my buddy Chris, who was the vet tech before me. If it wasn't for her, I would never make it. She was a great teacher. And, and she did it in a way where I could work myself into the medical and be able to do it. The hardest things, like you have a baby tiny, tiny baby squirrel that needs hydrated with a needle. You have to put that needle under that little baby's skin. It's like, oh no, it's, oh, that was so hard. Or given, even giving a shot was hard, but you had to do it, you know? I had to do it in order to help these animals. He came in, first of all, he came in, he was hit on the side of the road and um, he had a, a broken wing and we tried to fix that. I named him Mitch because the guy that found him and saved him, his name was Mitch. So that's how he got his name. But his wing just wouldn't heal. We'd take x-rays after it should have healed and it wasn't quite formed yet. 
So that's when we discovered that his wing isn't going to heal, so we'll keep him in captivity as an education animal. So he went to the bird area where they're tethered outside, you know, little leather straps on a, on a perch so they can be outside. And most of those birds, the birds of prey, they don't really fly a lot like our little songbirds. They just usually fly when they're going to get something to eat. So I didn't feel too bad for him having to stay in captivity and not fly. But so he was on this little perch and a dog got in the area and he tried to get away from the dog and it broke his leg. So then he came back to the clinic. And I was kind of glad to have him back because I really bonded with him when he had a broken wing. Um, so when I, and I, he was one of the animals I put to bed at night and I went in to put him to bed and I would just hold him in like, sort of preen his little feathers until he fell asleep and then I'd put him down and leave him. And one night when I went to put him to bed, his cast was coming off and I knew that would harm his leg if I didn't fix it before I went home. And it was at midnight or something, so nobody else was around, so I didn't have any help. And I knew that their talons are really, really powerful, like 300 pounds of pressure. And one leg obviously was in a cast, the other one was free. So when I held him, I always held that one leg like this, just in case he'd get scared and try to hurt me, not intentionally. But I knew I had to fix it, so I put him down and I went in the clinic and got all the wraps that I had to fix him. And I came back and put him on my lap and then I had to let go of that leg. And then I had to take the old cast off, which I knew probably hurt him. And that's what was amazing is that, that trust that he had in me. He didn't flinch, he didn't try to grab my leg or anything. He just watched me fix his leg. And when I was finished, I just cried because it was just, it was a spiritual experience. Just because, a, I guess native wildlife, first of all, was really amazing. He's a golden eagle that lives right here. And I was able to gain his trust enough to let me do that. I mean, that to me was really amazing. Just listening to them on a soul level, uh, or a, yeah, because you're, you're not speaking to them, they're not speaking to you, so you're um, feeling their feelings, you know. Yeah, people use the term whisperer. Right, yeah. yeah. I don't know, right. what, what do you think about that? Is that yeah, there are whispers. I, do you mm -hmm. consider yourself a whisperer? I, I would, because I'm not someone who communicates like an animal psychic like I'm hearing and I don't think they really he, the animal is not really talking what you have to interpret in human language what they're seeing or feeling is what a, a psychic would do I think but I don't I don't do that I just feel it's empathy more empathy than the psychic thing yeah that you just feel and know what they need you know and you try to provide that education squirrel. She was born without a bottom jaw, so we feed her powdered nuts. And everybody loves her. Hey Silver, you wanna play? You wanna play out here? Here you go. Well, uh, I don't know exactly why they went into my heart when I first um, took care of one at Wildlife Ranch as a baby, because um, I loved gorillas before that. And then when I raised a baby squirrel, they're just so special. And I think it's, they have a hard life, but they're really sweet and um, smart, very smart. Um, I just love their, their will to live and their, um, they can be happy and running around in the trees and they can be very serious and getting the work done that has to be done to survive. Um, and they have, special hearts, I think. And anybody who has been close to a squirrel knows that. And I think everybody that knows that can't explain it either, really. It's just, you know, you have a soul connection with a squirrel.
And I never really was, I didn't think a tattoo person, but it just felt right to have those special animals with me in that sense. Uh, like, like they're actually a part of me now. And that just feels really special. And she's a, uh, a little Eastern gray squirrel that was disabled that I had for seven and a half years. And she just died about a week ago. So um, when I went in to, I wanted to get Michael the gorilla that was so special to me. So when I went in to make an appointment for a consultation, it was going to be Michael here. And then, but by the time I, the consultation came, Mary had just died. And I said, no, this needs to be Mary. So it's really special because I have Weezer here and Mary here. I've had other disabled squirrels six years, you know, or whatever, seven years. And I only had him three, but I don't know. You know, he had, when he came in, he came in, some hikers had found him and because he had an upper respiratory infection, so he was wheezing. And they named him Weezer. We don't name him if we're gonna release him because that really attaches you. He was on death's door. I think I put a lot of my life into him because he was, every time I went to feed him, it looked like he would be dead. And then one time I lifted it up and he popped out and ran around the floor. And I went, oh, I called my boss and said, Weezer's up, Weezer's up. I was so excited. And we were basically going to raise him to release him. And But when he was weaned and his teeth came in, then we noticed that what had also happened, it probably made him wheeze. He knocked his uh, nose crooked and his whole jaw was out of alignment. So his teeth would grow, keep growing and the bottom teeth would grow into his nose and the top ones would go around into the roof of his mouth if he was released. So we knew he couldn't be released. We had to trim his teeth every four weeks. So he would, he, he, I kept him. <laughs> so I knew he wouldn't be released, so I just kept him. And we just formed a bond, you know, I'd, I'd have him. I lived in a cabin uh, in the woods with no electricity and I think he thought that was a squirrel house for him because I had a couple lofts and he loved to hang out in the lofts. So we lived more like a squirrel in that cabin. <laughs> and then when I lived here, he was in my back room and he had a cage back there, but I left the door open all the time. And he, in the morning before work, he would sit on my shoulder while I'd fix breakfast. And then I'd put him in his cage and lock the door when I wasn't here. But when I was here, and he would be playing around and wanted to take a nap. He'd just go in there and take a nap. And I had cats, but he was raised with the cats. So he was just like a member of the family. It just made you happy being around him. You know, there wasn't a sad bone in his body, I don't think, you know. <laughs> and he doesn't, didn't have to be sad or scared of anything because he was in captivity where everything was, he was full of love and everything. So. Squirrels in the wild live such a hard life, 50% of the babies don't even make it to their first birthday. So he was a lucky squirrel that he, he was only three when he died, but he had three good years, so. What's it feel like to, I mean, have a soulmate like that? Um, almost everybody who's had an animal at some time probably feels that connection deeper with one animal than another. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's reciprocated from the animal like yes i do i think that that's probably that maybe that's part of it why you feel connected on a soul level with an animal is because they feel on a soul level to you i bet you that's part of it never thought about that before but i mean weezer wanted to be on my shoulder whenever possible and just walk around the house with him there and if he wanted to just play, he would jump down and just play and then get back up on my shoulder. Um, where I've had other, other squirrels that just didn't do that, you know. So, it's like, I remember too with the apes, Michael had what I called a sweet soul, different than any other gorilla that I knew. And I knew a lot of gorillas, you know. So maybe there is, who knows, there might be a soul and a past life connection with that animal. You know, 
That's why you can't put it into words because it is a soul connection from another time. <laughs> I've always tried hard to find something to believe in, you know, that's, I know it's there, it's outside of, it's outside, but it's inside, I think. The Native Americans, I like what they say, that there is a creator that created all of this, but there's also the great mystery. I think because of his I had to trim his teeth and there might have been a little sharp part on it. One day I went in to get him and he had cut open his scrotum and things were falling out. And he was running around the house with blood and everything. And oh boy, I panicked. And I had to sedate him to, in order, I took him to Wildlife Image and sedate him before I could even see what happened, you know, and because he was just all over. When I saw that, I rushed him to the vet and, and everything went perfect and then just before he was sewing him up, that he died on the operating table, just, which was, oh, that was heartbreaking. Any rehabber will tell you it's the hardest job on your heart to do. Um, and I'm still friends with many rehabbers, and they're all still in my family, you know. They're, because they know how hard that job is. And, and most of them do them out of their homes and, you know, are doing a full-time job and helping these animals and with their own money and, you know. Some people say it doesn't make a difference, you know, the rehab. I mean, we run over them with our cars and we build in their territories. So it's our responsibility, I think, to take the ones that get harmed and put them back. I mean. Mm -hmm just one of the things we should be doing. But I, that's what I've always said about, you know, I've worked with animals since the 70s in just about every place, but this working here was the most amazing learning experience because you're working with wildlife, native wildlife. I've worked with gorillas and elephants and tigers, but it's not like native wildlife. And to have them, one, trust you enough that they don't hurt you when you're trying to mend them and then releasing them back to the wild is just an amazing feeling. Wildlife Images doesn't, you know, it doesn't make a product that makes money, so they're always struggling for money. And I was kind of at the era where they were really, it was really hard, and that's something a lot of people who are, <laughs> I don't mean to bring political thing, but the minimum wage, if it would, I agree with people getting paid, you know, a, a livable salary, but in places like nonprofits, when they raised the minimum wage when I was there, they had to let people go. And so that's when I was really working, working for three people, basically, you know, because we couldn't afford help. And it was, I know a board member came one time and I just, was crying to him and I said, I don't think I can do this anymore. It's just, you know, I was there till one and three o'clock in the morning trying to get things done. And, and, um, and like I was saying, Lenny was my, another sort of soul animal and he was a little lynx that I put to bed at night. And, and I remember telling him, I said, it just makes me sad that, um, oh Lenny, I hope I don't get so bad I have to leave you. And I did. And he was the hardest one to leave. And I remember I was still taking a Weezer to get his teeth trimmed when, after I left. And he would hear my voice, Lenny would, and he'd cry and cry and I'd have to go visit him. But I didn't know if it was good to visit him and then leave again or just not visit him. But just part of the job. <laughs> I've struggled a lot with it though, as far as, I don't think I'll ever have that passion in life that I have with animals, of that, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, they need me <laughs> and I need them, you know, that's just not gonna happen. 
it's like I was saying that saying um, you can never make a new old friend I don't think I'll ever be able to make those memories again so it's just kind of sad if I didn't have the animals that I have I would probably be traveling and working in places that needed me but you that's made a commitment to that. I did yeah and I just I have a hard time now leaving my home for more than a week I just can't be away from them that long and you know worry about them and they depend on me <laughs> you know Not everybody can have the experiences that I had. So it's, I think it's my responsibility in a way to write this book and share so the people who would never have that experience with a gorilla can have that experience. And all the animals that I uh, have in the book and related to, that everybody can experience that through the book and know they feel and think and it helps humans to think differently about non-humans and how we treat them. That's the point of the book, you know, that we're all a part of this and we need to treat everybody with compassion, every being. I, I wasted my life if I don't share my, what I experience with other people. Very selfish not to do that, I think. That's another reason I think that I was just put here to do what I've done because in most cases what I've done, people need degrees to do now. You know, I haven't had anything really beyond high school. But my love and determination, just in focus, you know. I think that's part of a spiritual calling too, is if you know what you're supposed to be doing and that's all you're focused on, then you'll get it because you're aligned with that energy that is who you are. And maybe a lot of people don't really know who they are, so they don't get it. <laughs> so I, when I look back, and my spiritual philosophy is kind of that, I said, well, I didn't even know it, but that's what I was doing. <laughs> you know, I just knew that's where I had to be, and nothing was going to stop me. You know? So, I mean, there were po parts in my life where... <laughs> I was in between animal jobs and it was just finding something that I did to make money. But I knew that's not where I was going to stay because <laughs> my heart wouldn't let me. <laughs>